All right, friends. Well, I know others will be joining us um, to prepare us for worship. I found a little video that I'm going to share. It is World Communion Sunday. And so people around the world in various denominations are sharing in the Lord's Supper, as we will. And particularly this year, I'm sure we'll all be doing it in interesting ways. Um, if you're with us for the first time, we're glad you're here. And while others are still coming on, we'll watch a little video about uh, World Communion Sunday. <laughs> So we welcome you to worship. If you joined us in the middle of that 
video. That was a video from the Presbyterian Outlook, uh, which gave you images of World Communion Sunday around the globe, which is today. Uh, we do have a special offering today. It is our peace and global witness offering. If you'd like to text to give, you can see uh, the number on the screen right now. 50% of this offering goes to our Presbyterian Mission Agency to advocate for peace and reconciliation and justice. 25% goes to our mid councils, our synods and presbyteries for the same work. And we can keep 25% of the offering here at Hudson to engage in any justice, peace or reconciliation work that the session or the congregation might be called to. So we ask you to give generously to this offering. There's more information in our church newsletter about other ways that you can give other than texting. Today, uh, we have drive-through communion. Hopefully you've already read about this. If you haven't, uh, after worship from 12 to two, after our Zoom worship, you can drive over to the church. You can see our map here. And we ask that you enter in on Langley and we have the communion table uh, in the middle of the parking lot. And then we ask that you exit on Cranbrook. And uh, so these are the entrances or the Langley entrance is the entrance that's open today. We will serve communion uh, here on our Zoom worship. But if you're going to participate in the drive-through communion, you can log off the Zoom meeting uh, as we begin uh, communion online, and you can continue your worship in the church parking lot from 12 to 2. Our fall festival is partnered with St. Mark's. You may remember that St. Mark's came up to our property and participated last year. This year, we're going to do a drive-through trunk or treat at St. Mark's United Methodist, just a couple of blocks down on Six Forks Road. It's Sunday, October 25th from 6 to 7 p.m. And we need uh, Hudson families to provide some trunks. And so we would love for you, if you'd love to decorate a trunk, to sign up for that. The theme is children's books and children's books that we've loved. And so if you'd like to decorate your car after a children's book, that's great. Um, there are ways to donate candy for that. And uh, there'll be uh, little bins outside the church doors at certain <laughs> dates and times. Please read the weekly window for details about that. A special thank you to Brian Bentledge, who is uh, a young man, a high schooler in our church. Uh, his uh, scout troop built chairs for our fire pit um, at the north end of the campus next to the labyrinth. And really helpful right now because they're all uh, single chairs and so people can socially distance and have their group meetings outside. So. We thank the whole Bentledge family for their support of this project, their, their scout troop, I believe it's scout troop 213, and especially Brian for planning all this and uh, beautifying our campus. Next Sunday, uh, we are doing another Sunday strolls. It's a way of doing fellowship in a socially distant way. And so anybody who'd like to go for a walk at 9 a.m., you can meet at the church and be done uh, by 1030 if you'd like to watch our service online at our normal worship time. So uh, we hope the weather will be as beautiful as it is today and invite folks to a time of worship. So friends, let us move from getting here to being here for worship. Come, let us gather around and see how the Spirit will nurture our faith 
today. Who is with us? Christ, the light of the world. Who is with us? The love of God who came to meet us in the world. Who is with us? The wisdom of God who speaks through the scriptures. Who is with us? The grace of God who proclaims we are children of God. Who is with us? Our risen Lord who meets us at table. We are here, Holy Spirit, ready for your leading. Let us worship God. So grateful that God meets us where we are. We're not in the church sanctuary, but our opening hymn today says, Come into God's presence, singing hallelujah. God is there in your living room, in your den, in your family room, wherever you are this morning if you're gathered in Christ's name. So we're so grateful that you're with us. We invite you to sing on this very, very easy hymn to sing. It's been too long, I'm glad to see you. This year I'm part of the uh, giving ministry team and uh, in the fall the giving ministry team takes a few weeks to um, encourage the congregation to think about what Hudson means to them and to ask the congregation to commit to supporting the church. The giving ministry team this year uh, watched a movie to get ready. It's called The Biggest Little Farm. You've probably heard some about it. Um, a beautiful movie about um, a young couple that decided they wanted to start a farm uh, and do it in a way that was as natural as possible, uh, working with nature to create the farm. And the way I thought of it as working with God's creation in harmony with God's creation to create the farm. Um, and it inspired our, um, both the verse we chose and um, our theme of times like these. But you might be wondering, uh, what does a farm and a church, what do they have to do with each other? I'm so glad you asked. I can think of at least three ways. First of all, they're both communities. Uh, a farm is a community um, of people. You can't just go out and farm on your own. You need people, the couple. They had a designer who had a vision for what the farm could be. They had a team of farm workers. But an important part of that community was also the animals and, and the plants that all came together and worked together to um, produce food. Um, and similarly, a church is a community of people in a place. Uh, we gather together to do God's work, um, but also part of our community is the place we gather, the church and the, the uh, buildings that we share with the community. And um, 
um, and and also the the larger community of of Christ's family is also part of that. The second way they're similar is um, commitment. You don't go farming without being committed. It is a lot of hard work. It's labor intensive, and it takes time to produce a good farm. And my gosh, these people did. Um, it was not always easy. They had some great challenges, uh, but they worked together and they overcame them. Um, and that's the way our church community is. It takes commitment. We, um, we build relationships over time. We uh, worship and sing and try to be inspired with what God wants us to do in the world. Um, and it's not always easy uh, working together and trying to decide what God wants us to do. Another way that a farm and a church are alike is that they require resources. Um, the couple that started the farm actually started by getting investors. They got some people to put up money so that they could buy the land and do the work. Um, and then there's the resources, all the talents of the couple uh, and the farm workers. Uh, but also the resources were the animals and plants doing what they naturally do um, and figuring out how that was going to work together. And in the same way, the church requires resources. Um, we bring our money. Uh, it costs money to do the things we do. Uh, we bring our time and we bring oh so many gifts. Um, and one of the most interesting things about church is uh, discovering those gifts uh, in community and trying to um, build God's world. So the final thing that they have in common is that it's worth it. Um, this church has meant a lot to me. Um, and um, on the farm side, I, I've been around plants all my life, but I, uh, I didn't seriously start trying to grow food until I was an adult. And so I thought I'd, I'd finish the, the message today by um, showing you showing you a few fruits of uh, of my my labors. The the summer garden is almost done, but we've got a few things here. I don't know what you can see. That's that's a little cherry tomato. Still got some good ones of those. There's a there's a green tomato. It's going to sit in my windowsill and ripen. Um, these are some little muscadine scupping on grapes. They're not like your table grapes, but they're wonderfully sweet. They're a southern grape. Uh oh. What have we got here? That's Swiss chard, but it looks more like Swiss cheese. I've been feeding the bugs, and you're gonna love this one. Look, there are my collard greens. Now, if you're not familiar with collard greens, they're supposed to be leaves, so the bugs gotta eat too. Um, this is, you'll like this one. This is a sweet pepper called a candy cane, isn't it pretty? The yellow and green stripes together. I, sometimes I look at them so much I forget to eat them. Um, you shouldn't be able to grow kiwi in North Carolina, but you can. A friend of mine gave me two vines and um, it's been fun. Um, and finally, the last fig of the season. If you don't have fresh figs in your life, I wish you fresh figs next year. Mm. Come on, yeah. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this community and we thank you for all the farmers out there that work with your creation to provide us nourishment. Thank you for the spirit nourishment that we get from this community and we pray that we can do your work in the world. Live as Jesus taught us and spread your love wherever we go. Amen. Friends, let us come to God in confession, first hearing the voice of community and then in some moments of silent reflection. Let us pray. Merciful God, there are so many things on our hearts and minds that we are easily distracted from your call to care for those in need to honor the diversity in every person and to preserve your creation. Touch our hearts anew so that we love with abandon, 
inspire our imaginations once again in order that we allow space for all to live fully and give us the courage when we need to speak truth to power. Embolden us to step out in faith, trusting you in all things. We pray in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And now hear the silent confessions of our hearts. Amen. Friends, as we have confessed our sin, we are assured in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven as we are reconciled to God and to one another. Thanks be to our merciful God for this incredible gift of grace and love. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. Our scriptures today are from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Listen for the Spirit's movement in these words. Then the Lord spoke these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make your, for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. You should not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let the God speak to us for we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How are you when it comes to rules? Like when the speed limit is 65, are you a 65 mile per hour on the nose type of person? Or are you a, well, the cops don't pull anyone over unless I'm going 75 or higher in a 65 zone. So I'll go 74 type of person. Um, or are you a, I'll take my chances and do whatever I want kind of person. When you see a temporary road closed barricade in the middle of a street that you always cut through on your way to work, and you see that the road might not actually be totally closed. Do you try to go down it anyway? Or do you listen to what the sign is telling you? How about when you're in high places, up in skyscrapers or at the Grand Canyon or a cliff view on the Blue Ridge Parkway? Do you like going right up to the edge of the window or the cliff? or leaning over the guardrail? Or do you get that funny feeling in your gut, the danger feeling, and you just don't want to get right to the edge? You say the view way back here is just fine, thank you very much. Whether it's speed limits or 
road closed signs or guardrails or that funny feeling you get in your gut when something feels a bit dangerous. All these things are about keeping you safe. Depending on how we are wired and the situation, we are more or less attuned to the guardrails and limits around us. In almost all my examples, there is a fair amount of freedom. We don't have governors on the gas pedals that make us go a certain speed. There's not a cop on every corner waiting to pull us over. Usually road close signs don't block the whole street off. And most fences you can climb over or even walk around. So we all ultimately have to decide what we're going to do with our freedom, even when we get some strong guidance. Thanks to Mike Law for reading our Ten Commandment text this morning. I will tell you that on Monday, when I was deciding which lectionary text to preach on, I suddenly found the Ten Commandments delightfully refreshing, maybe in a way I never have before. In a time where there are so many unknowns in our nation and the world, I saw the Ten Commandments in that moment as something solid, some solid guidance that can bring stability to our lives. These are some good guardrails to live by and keep out of trouble with. Ancient guidance from God about our relationship with God and with each other. And they sound pretty good and reasonable to me in this moment. While Mike Law read us the Ten Commandments themselves, the scene set up before our passage is pretty daunting. God has come down on a mountaintop. The mountain is covered in a cloud. God actually says to Moses, you shall set limits for the people all around this mountain. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's thick clouds, there are prohibitions about the people even touching the mountain of God. And on top of it all, a terrifying, loud, divine trumpet. It's out of this divine display that the voice of God gives the commandments to the people. And I don't know if you caught it at the end of the scripture reading, but the people are so terrified that they say to Moses, we don't want God to speak to us anymore. Moses, you, we want you to speak to us. I think we should give that little verse serious analysis. I wonder if some of their thinking is, we're not going to go around God's guardrails, but your guardrails, Moses, maybe we can cheat just a little bit on yours. Aren't we always looking for ways around things? I've officiated a lot of weddings through the years, and I was prepping this sermon, and I was thinking about the I do section of the wedding service. The question goes like this, understanding that God has created, ordered, and blessed the covenant of marriage, do you affirm your desire and intention to enter into this covenant? If so, please say, I do. The one thing I love about this is it takes two to tango. God creates a covenant out of love for us, and we need to speak aloud, I do, to the covenant. In other words, I get it. I step up to the plate. I agree to it. God frees the Israelites from slavery out of love for them. Then God gives them a means to respond to God's love in the form of these commandments. But the interesting part of the story is God gives the commands and doesn't follow them up with a question like we have in the wedding. Is it your desire, wandering Israelites, and your intention to enter into this covenant? The people 
never get asked that question. And they most certainly never say, I do. Instead, they say, we'd rather hear from this little less intimidating figure over here, Moses. He's less intense than God. I wonder if we do the same as the wandering Israelites. We get loose with our I do's. But it's in times like these when the commands of God look pretty good, tangible guardrails to say I do to. And times when we feel like now a little bit off the rails, we need to be reminded of who God is and what God has done. Now, some complain about the Ten Commandments because they're framed in don't language. And people say they're too negative. Don't bear fault witness. Don't covet your neighbor's spouse. Okay? If you want a positive version, then turn to Jesus. He just took the Ten Commandments and simplified them. Love God, which is the first five commands, and love your neighbor as yourselves, the second five commandments. God is the creator of any love and goodness you've ever experienced. God understands suffering because of what Jesus went through. God never leaves us alone, but doesn't control everything or intervene all the time. God is about freedom and justice, hope and mercy, especially for the oppressed. So following commandments, staying in the guardrails, is a means by which we can respond to God. We don't do it because it brings afterlife salvation. We do it because it brings order to our chaos right now. It's a pathway to affirming God's love in our lives. None of us is untouched, whether COVID-19 has merely required us to change our habits or whether we are suffering from it personally, whether we have lost loved ones to the virus that we cannot see and we cannot avoid. And so we find ourselves coming to our tables this day unsure of how this is going to play out, disoriented because so much is changing and somewhat fearful, if not greatly fearful for the future. It is well for us to remember that when Jesus initiated this sacred meal with his dearest friends in an upper room, it was following a Passover meal when he knew his time was nearing an end. And even though his friends did not understand what was going on, they knew that darkness was descending. And when next they gathered after his death and resurrection, they were brokenhearted and disoriented, and the friends did not recognize who Jesus was at first. They were unsure of what to do. They were afraid that the authorities would find them and connect them somehow to Jesus. But in the midst of that scene, in the breaking of the bread, they recognized their Lord was with them. They were reminded that the worst that happens to humanity can never overcome the love of God made real in the presence of Jesus Christ. Friends, we come to our many tables this morning at his invitation to eat together as one family, to recall Jesus and his friends as they shared this meal, to be nourished for our journeys and standing firmly in the hope of the new creation that is on the distant horizon. During the time of prayer, you are invited to lift up people and situations using the chat feature if you would like to do that. And if you are requesting prayers for someone else, just remember that this is a public space and be sensitive to that. Let us pray. In every time and every age, O oh God, we give you thanks for your mercy is sure. Your steadfast love endures forever. In your compassion, you gave us Jesus Christ who frees us from darkness and lights our path to endless renewal and life eternal. 
And so with all of creation, with the needy and the hungry ones, with those who have enough and plenty, with creatures large and small, with all creation, we praise your name. Hear now our prayers for the world that you have made. Blessed are you, O Spirit, giver of life. You give us words when we have none. You fill us with vision when we have the most need. You give us voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. Be our guide and teacher today and always. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all things. By your power and love, you continue to deliver your people from bondage, thwart the designs of evil, and show the way through the wilderness as you turn hardship into righteousness and reveal your hand upholding all that is just and right. Hear our prayers for peace and justice this day. And blessed are you, O Christ, servant of the universe. You came among us to feed and heal and teach us to love one another. Hear our prayers for those who are suffering and are in special need this day. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, bind us in love to the church of every time and place, loving one another. May we bear witness that we are disciples of Christ as we await the day when we will all share this feast at one table in your presence, through Christ, in Christ, and with Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It was on the night of his arrest that our Lord took the bread from the table. And after giving thanks, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup from the table saying, this cup represents my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, you do so remembering me. And each and every time you share this feast, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to share in the feast together. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for feeding us once again at these tables of grace and welcome. Continue to sustain us, empower us for ministry, and so that we might serve you faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now go, remembering always that in the grace of God you were born, and in the providence of God you are kept all the day long, and in the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ you have been redeemed. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.